There's a powerful scene in the second episode of season one of The Chosen, the TV series about the life of Jesus. And it takes place not long after Jesus exercised the multiple demons that had tormented Mary Magdalene. And in this scene, someone who had known Mary uh, only as a demon-possessed woman was astonished to see her and um, to see the change uh, that he saw in her and asked if she could tell him what had happened. So she told him how Jesus sought her out and called her by name and said, you are mine, I have redeemed you. But beyond that, she couldn't account for the miracle that changed her life. She said, what I can tell you is this, I was one way and now I am completely different. And the thing that happened in between was him. See, Jesus, you cannot encounter have an encounter with Jesus Christ and remain the same. One of the things that seems to be all too common among Christians today is that, sure, we understand the gospel. Uh, we believe the gospel. Most of us can accurately explain the gospel in terms of what God, by his grace, has done for us by sending Jesus to die on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins and then raising him from the dead for our justification. We know all that. We, we take it literally, what the Bible says about these historical events. But then we, we sort of romanticize the part of the gospel that promises to transform our lives. And I wonder why we do that. Why do we tend to take the things Jesus and the apostles teach us in the New Testament about the practical realities of our salvation and hold them up as standards that we heartily affirm but can never live up to. Behaviors we strive for but miserably fail to master. All the while insisting that we have victory in Jesus as we acknowledge, excuse, and even defend our old nature the sinful heart, and the weakness of the flesh when it comes to our resisting the temptations that come our way. And because of this, we lack the assurance of our salvation, and our spiritual growth is stunted. Many even seem to be duty-bound to remind themselves that even though Jesus died on the cross as the final atoning sacrifice for our sins, who forgave our sins, who took away our sins was the propitiation that satisfied God's wrath for our sins and then gave us his righteousness and set us free. Despite all this, many consider it a mark of proper humility to continue to insist that even though we have been born again, our hearts remain deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And to claim otherwise raises suspicions that perhaps we think more highly of ourselves than we ought to think. Or that we are promoting a false doctrine that claims that we can achieve entire sanctification or holiness perfection, sinless perfection in this life. Or are somehow otherwise misrepresenting the gospel. In the meantime, they continue to struggle with the same bad habits and problems that have plagued them year after year. They never seem to change. They show few, if any, signs of spiritual growth. And yet, the Bible tells us repeatedly that we are new creations in Christ, that we are sons and daughters of the living God, that our old self was crucified with Christ, and we now walk in newness of life. And still, some have made it an article of faith to declare that the miracle of regeneration has no effect on the sinful condition of the human heart. And that our justification is a mere legal formality, a sort of a ceremonial proclamation that officially declares sinners to be righteous in God's sight, even though in actuality they remain sinners. Sinners saved by grace, to be sure, but sinners nonetheless. They believe that God has declared them to be righteous in his sight because of their faith in Christ, which is true. 
but not because they've actually changed, but because God has simply changed his mind about their sin, graciously offers his pardon in spite of their sin, looks the other way and promises to remember their sins no more. So despite the fact that in the parable of the four soils, for example, Jesus says that those who are truly believers have an honest and good heart. They're convinced that their hearts are still deceitful and wicked above all else, and their fallen, sinful nature remains. And we have the audacity to call that good news. How can this be? How can God declare sinners to be righteous when he knows that we are still sinful? Is this all make-believe? Is he pretending that we are something we are not? And does he expect us to go along with the charade? Is the new birth real? Or are we just faking it? Or does believing the truth of the gospel manifest itself in us actually becoming a new creation? With our corrupt, sinful human nature restored to the original factory settings of righteousness that humans were created to have before the fall. Original righteousness. Do we really have the righteousness of Christ? Do we really have a new heart and a new spirit and a new mind and a new nature? Does regeneration result in us actually being people who are miraculously transformed by the indwelling power of the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead and now gives life to our mortal bodies? The Bible says it does. In fact, God himself swore an oath guaranteeing it is true. Listen to Hebrews 6, 16 through 18. For people swear by something greater than themselves, and in all their disputes, an oath is final for confirmation. So when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise, that's us, the unchangeable character of his purpose, he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope that is set before us. So what distresses me about these questions pertaining to the transforming power of the gospel is how hesitant some of us are to embrace them as defining who we are in Christ in accordance with what the Bible teaches. Are we saints or are we sinners? According to the New Testament, those who believe and follow Jesus are saints. They are never again referred to in Scripture as sinners. Did you know that? But because we don't like either or dichotomies, we have manufactured an alternative third category that allows us to, ex to excuse our sin and ungodliness based on the notion that professing Christians can comfortably live compromised lives dominated by the world, the flesh, and the devil. And regardless of all outward evidence to the contrary, they are still saved. Righteous sinners. That's an oxymoron. The problem I have with such thinking is that we find no such alternative category mentioned anywhere in the New Testament. But we've created one nonetheless, largely because we live in an age where people tend to be uncomfortable with these kinds of dichotomies. We prefer the comfort and safety afforded to us by gray areas over the discomfort of the harsh realities of black and white. Now, I'm not suggesting that Christians are incapable of sinning and can become morally perfect in this life, but what I am saying is that you, if you have truly been born again, you have gained the ability to not sin, to go and sin no more. The patterns of sin that once dominated your life and defined who you were uh, in Adam are broken up. And over time, the desire to sin is increasingly displaced 
by a stronger, more compelling desire to please God and pursue righteousness and holiness and godliness. We call this sanctification. But the change is as real as it is radical. I was one way, and now I am completely different. And it's because of Jesus. Now, I happen to believe that everything in the Bible, that everything that the Bible tells us about who we are in Christ, in contrast to who we were in Adam, is absolutely, unequivocally, and literally true. And it's true because God himself has guaranteed that it's true in establishing a new covenant with his people. According to the preacher in Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 22, he says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart. Not a deceitful heart, a true heart. In full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean, from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. You see, God only deals in truth and reality. The gospel is not make-believe. Justification is not a fiction. Christ's righteousness is our possession. God is not pretending that we are something that we are not, and neither should we. I wonder how many of you would dare to believe that you have an honest and good heart this morning, that he has forgiven all your sins, past, present, and future, and cleansed you from all unrighteousness, and that you now stand before him, as Paul says, holy and blameless and above reproach. Now somebody, um, not someday, but, but right now, that's who we are in Christ. Because, beloved, the good news is that what the Bible says you are, that's how God sees you. And what God believes is true about you is what is true about you. He hasn't just done something for us in salvation. He has also done something to us. Something real that has changed our lives and secured our eternal destiny in his kingdom. In the meantime, we live in this fallen world. We still battle the temptations of this world, the flesh and the devil. So in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus gives us practical instructions on how we as saints and citizens of the kingdom of heaven are to live in this fallen world until he comes. And it's as radically different from how we, how we used to live. Now, as we come to this final section of the Sermon on the Mount this morning, Jesus lays out a series of dichotomies that highlight the difference between saints who are in the kingdom and sinners who are not. And what people find disturbing is that in each case, he offers no third alternative. No compromise position, no gray areas. It's one way or the other. Now, you recall that Jesus began this sermon back in chapter 5 when, with what we call the Beatitudes, where he identifies eight distinguishing traits of those who have been changed by the gospel, those who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven. He says they are poor in spirit. They mourn over their sin. They are meek. They hunger and thirst after righteousness. They're merciful. They are pure in heart. They are peacemakers. And they are, like, they are likely to be persecuted for the name of Jesus and for righteousness' sake. And in every case, Jesus declares that these people are blessed, approved by God, and because they are approved by God, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. They shall be comforted. They shall inherit the earth. Their, their hunger and thirst for righteousness shall be satisfied. 
they will receive mercy. They shall see God, and they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. Well, over the past several weeks, we've been studying these radical words of Jesus. Some of them are difficult to hear, challenging words to be sure, but in every case, they are words that force us to realize that there is an observable and experiential distinction between those who are citizens of the kingdom of heaven and those who are not. Now this morning, we come to this final section of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 7, 12 through 29 that Jen and Steve just read for us. Um, and just an outline here of where we're going. Uh, There's the golden rule in verse 12. There are two gates in verses 13 and 14, two trees in verses 15 through 20, two motives in verses 21 through 23, and two outcomes in verses 24 through 27, and then finally one authority in verses 28 and 29. Now, there's too much here to cover in the time we have left this morning, given my long-winded introduction to this. So we'll only be able to cover verses 12 through 14 this morning, and we'll save the rest till next week. But this final section begins with a command that is well known to Christians and non-Christians alike. We call it the golden rule. And the golden rule is this, verse 12. So whatever you wish that others would do to you, do also to them, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, it may surprise you to know that Jesus didn't invent the golden rule. The crowd he was speaking to had heard it before from their rabbis. This basic principle was taught by the most prominent rabbis of Jesus' day. Only they expressed it in the negative. What is hateful to you, do not do to anyone else. This is the whole law, and all the rest is commentary. There have been various... Um, variations to the golden rule throughout the ages. Um, the, fi the fictional gunfighter, J.B. Books, played by John Wayne in his last movie, latest, well, his last movie, last Western, um, called The Shootist, had his own version of the golden rule. He said, I won't be wronged. I won't be insulted. I won't be laid a hand on. I don't do these things to other people, and I require them this, and I require the same from them. Now, it's an, it has an appealing ring to it, doesn't it? And it sounds like the Wild West version of Jesus' own words, but it's not. See, J.B.'s code of ethics is, I expect others to show me the respect I deserve and to treat, them the way I, and to treat me the way I want to be treated. And if they don't, I'll make them wish they had. See, not only does the Duke get it wrong, he seems to have forgotten the part about turning the other cheek. Other variations we hear are, do unto others so that they will do unto you, or do unto others before they do unto you. See, these distortions of the golden rule are all self-serving ways people treat each other in order to protect their own self-interests. But Jesus says the golden rule embodies the moral and ethical principles of the entire Bible, for this is the law and the prophets. Now, you notice that Jesus offers no hint that the golden rule is either self-serving or reciprocal. There are more than 50 one another commands in the New Testament. This isn't one of them. Nor does he guarantee that others will treat you the way you want to be treated if you follow the golden rule. But if people actually lived like this, there would be far less pain and suffering in this world. The smorgasbord of real and imagined injustices being pro uh, protested across the globe exists precisely because people are treating others in ways that they themselves would never tolerate if they were on the receiving end. Jesus turns the contemporary rabbi's negative command to avoid harming others into a positive command that requires us as his followers to be the initiators and to bless others regardless of how they treat us. Do for others what you would want them to do for you. 
treat others with the same dignity and respect you would want if you were in their shoes. Speak to them the same way you would want to be spoken to. Give them the same consideration and grace you would want to receive if you were in their circumstances. Can you imagine a single conflict, big or small, whether between nations or your neighbor, or between husbands and wives that could not have been avoided or resolved by humbly following this simple rule? It does away with all cheating, lying, gossip, theft, slander, revenge, violence, or anything else that would harm another person, their interests, or their reputation. But that's not all it does. It promotes positive interaction with others, showing kindness and mercy, being truthful, being polite and considerate of others, and looking out for their interests ahead of your own. Why? Because that is how we want to be treated, isn't it? See, the difference between what Jesus expects and what John Wayne expects is that the Duke requires others to treat him the way he demands they be treated or else. But the King requires us to treat others the way we would want to be treated regardless of how they treat us. That's grace. Paul gives us another variation of this kingdom principle in Philippians 2. Verses 3 and 4, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now the question we have to ask ourselves is this. How would I feel if someone did to me what I'm doing to them? How would I feel if someone spoke to me the way I just spoke to them? or treated me like I'm treating them. Most likely, you'd be hurt, insulted, offended, angered, embarrassed, and great damage would be done to the relationship. So Jesus says that as citizens of the kingdom of heaven, we are to take the initiative to treat others the same way we would want to be treated because it's this kind of grace that fulfills the law and the prophets and identifies us as saints and citizens of the kingdom of God. Remember that Jesus also said that to love our neighbor as ourselves fulfills the law and the prophets. So treating others the way we would want to be treated is a powerful demonstration of loving our neighbor. Well, this marks the end of the main body of Jesus' sermon but he's not quite finished. He wants his audience to respond to the message, so he offers them a series of definitive dichotomies that mutually are, are mutually exclusive, exclusive options that require them to make a choice. It's an either-or choice, black or white, one way or the other. He offers no middle ground, no compromise position, no third alternative. Well, the first dichotomy has to do with two roads leading to two gates, verses 13 and 14. He says, enter by the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction, and those who enter by it are many. For the gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life, and those who find it are few. Now, notice all the contrasts built into this first dichotomy. Narrow and wide, hard way, easy way, life, destruction, few, many. In each pair, one is the polar opposite of the other. Leading up to each gate is a road, a broad one and a narrow one. The broad road leading to the wide gate is the easy road. It's the popular road. It's easy to find. It's well marked. It's well traveled. It's paved with good intentions and conventional wisdom and popular opinions and false idols and the world's approval. But this easy road only leads downhill to the gates of hell, 
a wide gate through which the masses enter without realizing where they are headed until it's too late. And they find that it leads to their eternal destruction. The narrow road is the hard road leading upward to the narrow gate. It's off the beaten path. It's hard to find. It's difficult to navigate. But it leads to eternal life and the entrance into the kingdom of heaven. The narrow road requires us to pay careful attention where we are and where we're going and to watch our step. It's the way that is illuminated by the word of God, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The destination is the narrow gate into the heavenly kingdom through which only the few who persevere to the end will enter and be saved. Jesus said in Luke 13, 27, strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. Notice again that Jesus offers no third alternative, no middle road, no alternate route. You can't get to the narrow gate by taking the broad road. So the uncomfortable truth is that no one who remains on the broad road is headed for the, and headed for the wide gate will enter into the kingdom of heaven. By the same token, those who remain on the narrow road will find their way to the narrow gate and arrive safely in the kingdom of heaven. Very simply, those who are traveling this broad, this broad road are those who do not believe in Jesus. They believe that if they come to God at all, they can come on their own terms. They've chosen their own path, thinking that it will lead to ultimate fulfillment in this life, only to find destruction at the end of their journey. On the other hand, those who are on the narrow road are believers who will enter the eternal gates um, and find eternal life in God's kingdom. Jesus is that narrow gate. He's the only way. He said in John 14, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. But the world says, all roads eventually lead to the narrow gate. There are many ways to God. If you're a good person, it doesn't matter what road you're on, what path you choose, as long as you are sincere in what you believe and stay true to yourself, you'll get there. Later on in this passage, Jesus will show us how disastrous it is to build your house on that worldly philosophy, but that will have to wait until next week. Would you pray with me? Father, these are stark realities that um, somehow get blurred in our vision of our salvation and uh, the focus of our life gets a little bit off from the truth of your word. And we pray, Father, that, that we would zero in on these truths with a laser-like focus and that we would be convicted to the depths of our souls that um, perhaps there are things in our lives that should not be and that there are distinctives that, um, that should not define us. We thank you, Father, for the glorious truth of the gospel that has caused us to be born again by your, by your spirit and has transformed us at the very level of our nature. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.